Hi frugal friends, welcome to your daily dose of frugality. On the YouTube channel is fire for me. If you have tuned in to our daily dose of frugality series here on this channel, you know that my name is Kim and together I'm helping us work through this little book called 365 Ways to Live Cheap by Trent Ham. This is a compilation video of all of the tips and tricks given in this book to help us be thrifty with our automobiles. So if you have seen all of those segments, this will be a little bit of a recap for you. And if you haven't been able to tune in to our Daily Dose of Reality segment, um, you can kind of knock out all the videos in this one video. Thanks for tuning in and I hope you enjoy. And we will start with the first one, which is focus on reliability and fuel efficiency. It's easy to get excited about all the latest features when you're considering a car purchase, but instead of focusing on the DVD player or leather seats, focus on these buying tactics instead. Do your research before you go near a car dealership. Examine the most recent car buying issue of Consumer Reports for starters, and carefully study their findings on reliability as well as their overall conclusions. Cars marked as highly reliable have significantly lower expenses for repairs over the lifetime of the car, directly saving you cash. Focus on buying late model used cars as they often have the best long-term value for the dollar. Put a high emphasis on fuel efficiency. Over 75,000 miles of driving, a 15 mile per gallon car guzzles 5,000 gallons of gas, while a 20 mile per gallon car only uses 3,750 gallons. At $4 per gallon, that's a savings of $5,000, and that's if gas prices hold steady. Know your numbers before you go. Use the Kelly Blue Book to find out the value of your current car, if you're planning on trading, and the value of the car you're looking at. You will then have a sense of how fair the offer is. So just like in the appliances section, they're starting out with basically do your research. If you're in the market for a new car, make sure you go to the dealership with an idea of what you're looking for and also an idea of the value of the car that you're trading in. Um, very similar to appliances, Jesse and I uh, mostly purchased used cars. We have purchased one new car and it was a very exciting experience. And our new car, as of this point, I think it's 14 years old, <laughs> so it's not so new anymore. But I remember when we went to the dealership, we didn't really have a solid grasp on what we were looking for. We knew we wanted something that was pretty reliable and that you know, could be an everyday car for me. I was uh, doing a little bit of commuting at the time, and so we wanted to be able to do some road trips in it and so forth. So we went to the dealership, and once you get there, as anyone who's bought a car off a dealership knows, the sales pressure is pretty high. And so even though we had a really wonderful sales agent that was helping walk us through the process, it didn't feel like a great time to be making a lot of like questionings about making the decision simply because the pressure felt so high. So definitely going with something in mind, a plan in place, how much you want to spend, maybe the, the key features that you're looking for or the exact model that you're looking for and what you plan to get for your car with trade-in value. I think going armed with all of that knowledge and information is going to really help when you have to do those negotiations and kind of work with the sales team since it can be kind of a higher pressure environment. I also think that if, if you can get a used car, um, Jesse's done a video on how much that can save you. My brother-in-law was able to purchase a car that hardly cost any money and that thing runs great and it's been working really really well for him. It came from an older woman who was a single car owner and she had kept it in her garage and had um, a stack of papers about this thick with all of its history as far as uh, maintenance and all the different things that had been done through it to it throughout the years and so he got a screaming deal on a really low mileage well-maintained older vehicle that works perfectly for what they use it for which is commuting to and from work in the grocery store so cars can be a very expensive purchase that depreciate really quickly so if you are going to buy a new car make sure you go armed with information even if you're gonna go buy a used car go armed with information and make the best decision that's right for you and your family. Today we're on the second tip of this section, which is to read the manual. Your car's manual is a treasure trove of tips and bits of information that can save you a lot of money over the long haul. 
It should be your primary source for information about how to care for your car and maximize its lifespan. Most of the information available through popular culture about automobile care and maintenance is placed there by organizations wanting to maximize their profits by convincing you that you need maintenance, replacements, and upgrades far more frequently than you actually need them. Read the next few tips and see how often the car manual comes into play to save you money. I will admit that the only thing I've really looked at the car manual for is warning lights on the dash. <laughs> when a warning light comes onto the dash of our Honda Fit and I don't recognize it, I will look in the manual to see what that warning light means and then seek the proper maintenance. I think this book was written in 2009 and I would say that since then, in addition to the manual for your car, YouTube is actually a really great spot to go for car repair and car maintenance type things. I know we had a part break on our truck and I was able to follow a pretty simple YouTube video to fix it. And I felt really proud of myself for getting out there and figuring out what I needed and then going to the, the store and exchanging the parts and then replacing it. And so I was able to do that through watching a YouTube video and then also Jesse's pretty handy and he was only a phone call away. So I think, yes, look at your car manual. Yes, don't be duped into getting maintenance that isn't necessary for the health and well-being of your car. Um, but also maybe pair it up with more modern resources like YouTube channels or even car maintenance podcasts and things like that. Maybe you can get some information, some supplemental information that way as well. We're on tip number three of that section, which is don't buy a service contract or an extended warranty. When you try to make an automobile purchase, the dealer will often try to encourage you to purchase a service contract or an extended warranty on your new vehicle. Say no. If you're interested in such plans, you can shop around for a low-cost service plan. If you're concerned about a warranty, you can purchase one directly from a warranty provider such as Warranty Direct without paying the additional dealer markup. Plus, it gives you time while your basic warranty is in place to do the research and pick out the warranty that's right for you. And it will be far cheaper than what you'd buy at the dealership. I do know there's one dealership in our area that gives away, I think, oil changes for life. And a lot of people really like to go there and buy their car because then if they live in this area and they don't move, they can get their oil changed there for the life of their car. I think I was reflecting back upon Jesse and I purchasing our Honda Fit when we bought it new. And I know we had some sort of service plan, but I don't believe it was an additional cost. I think it was just a perk of buying the car. And I think it lasted for about two years and we were able to take it in for oil changes and then we were able to take it in for a few other things that happened within that first two years. And then lucky for us, <laughs> there was some sort of weird glitch in their system and I think they were upgrading to a different computer or software system and there was some sort of glitch and so our two years restarted. So we actually had this for four years which is pretty phenomenal. So both of us thought, you know, hey this thing's expired but we kept getting reminders and we kept going in for our free services and we kept getting our free little coffees that came with the service and we did that for four years which was pretty awesome. So um, thank heavens for technology glitches that work in your favor, right? But I think this is a good rule of thumb with most big purchases. If it comes with a service contract or an extended warranty, maybe don't immediately purchase it. Maybe try and see if there's another way that you can get it for a little bit less money or see if it makes sense to have it at all. Um, if you've purchased a service contract or an extended warranty and it's really been a lifesaver, I would love to hear from you. You can comment below. The fourth tip in this section, which is to air up all of your tires. Airing up a car tire is a very simple free procedure that takes only a couple of moments yet can save you a bundle over time. According to the Car Care Council, a mere one PSI drop in air pressure in all four tires can reduce your gas mileage by 0.4%. And your car can easily be 10 PSI low without even noticing it, a 4% reduction in gas mileage. Over 10,000 miles in a 20 mile per gallon car with gas at $4 a gallon, you can save yourself $80 by just airing them up. Look inside your car's manual to find out the recommended maximum pressure for tires on your automobile and also to find out details on the exact procedure to follow. 
Again, they're referencing the car manual, so we can crack that open and look at the ideal tire pressure for our vehicle. We have been having trouble for some reason with our Honda uh, having low tire pressure in the back left tire. And we've gotten new tires and it seems like it continues to happen. And so I'm very familiar with all of the places in our county that I can find free air. <laughs> uh, there's been numerous times when I've been out and about and the tire pressure light will come on. And because I have the manual and I've looked in it and I see that that's the light, I will go um, check the air pressure in my tires and I will fill them up. And it seems like it's always the back left tire that's the lowest that's setting off the alarm. But while I'm doing that, <laughs> I can fill up the other tires as well. And so I didn't realize that this saved me in gas mileage or in mile per gallon, um, but I'm excited that that's a byproduct of this weird flaw that our car seems to have. So if you are someone who checks your tire pressure and fills your tires up regularly for fuel efficiency, I would love to hear from you Ready below. To dive into number five, which is buy the cheap gas. The idea that you need high octane gas for your car is mostly a relic from the days of older cars that could actually maximize the use of higher octane gas. Today, most cars run just fine on low octane fuel. Check your owner's manual to see what the recommendation is for your car and buy the cheapest you can within that recommendation. If buying cheaper gas saves you 10 cents per gallon on a 20 mile per gallon car over the course of 10,000 miles, you'll save $50 in lower gas bills. I have always been someone who's bought the cheapest gas possible. Um, I learned from Jesse that there might be some other options that are better for our vehicle, but I have always pushed that lowest button and I didn't even pay attention to the other two. I do feel like sometimes there are other ways that you can maximize your savings if you are already purchasing the lowest octane gas. One would be uh, buying your gas someplace where you're getting rewards points. So here in the United States, if you shop at a grocery store that also has a gas station, often your grocery purchases will add up to create an extra like five, 10, 20 cents off per gallon on your gas. So today I actually filled up the car and it was at our local grocery store that also has a gas station and I saved an extra 10 cents a gallon. And since I was low on gas, I went ahead and used all of it. If I was only topping off or something for a road trip, I could save it for when I'm you know, filling up with the most gas possible. So I do think that that's one really good option. We also have a truck that runs on propane which is an alternative fuel source. I know some people choose to use diesel and there's a few other options that you can use. Um, hopefully one day we all go electric and find a way to use solar power or wind power to generate um, the electricity for our electric vehicles. But until that happens, just check around and see if you have the opportunity to buy a car that uses an alternative type of fuel and you find that that type of fuel is cheaper in your area that could be a really good option as well. So um, the truck that we have that runs on propane, I fill it up using my husband's propane company. Um, so Jesse works for a propane company and we um, are able to get a discounted rate on those fills, which is really handy. So I usually just meet one of his delivery drivers when they're out somewhere and he'll fill the truck up and so, um, I find that it runs really well on the propane and it seems a little bit cheaper and a little bit more cost effective and possibly better for the environment. But again, let's all go electric and then we'll really be doing our part. Um, but until then, let me know if you use an alternative fuel source for your vehicle or if you found other ways that you can kind of save when you're, you're filling up your car. Um, and I would love to hear about that in the comments below. Tip is don't get an oil change every 3,000 miles. The mantra for oil changes is that you should get one every 3,000 miles and most car owners quickly run off to get that oil change right on schedule. You might be surprised to find that the owner's manual suggests an oil change every 5,000 miles or on some models even less frequently. In fact, 5,000 miles is the recommendation from Consumer Reports as well as the guys from NPR's Car Talk. If you drive your car for 60,000 miles while you own it, just following the factory recommendation saves you eight oil changes. We have an oil fuel or an oil life indicator on our car 
and it doesn't match up with 3,000 miles or even the date recommendation but we do tend to follow it so it will come down and tell us how much oil we have or something like that and it gets down to you know 15 10 five percent and we never usually go any lower than ten percent but that indicator will pop up and it'll just say hey your oil life's at ten percent and one of us will take the car in to get an oil change i do think that you might be able to save money if you change your own oil as well which is something that I think I could do with our Ford F-150 a little bit easier than the car. It sits up higher off the ground and the mechanics under it just seem to be a little bit more cut and dry. Everything with the car seems to be like tucked into these little pockets and it's kind of hard to get to. So I do think when the weather cools down a little bit and I wouldn't be just laying on hot asphalt out there, I would like to try changing our truck's oil. I would love to hear from you if you change your own car oil and how much that saves you. And if you have any other tips on how to get cheaper oil changes, we're pretty thrifty in that area. We get a monthly coupon pack that will often have you know, a greatly discounted oil change and so we'll use that coupon or we'll go somewhere if they're having a special or a sale. But I always love to know ways that you can save money on things. And so if you have suggestions on how you can save money on changing your car or truck oil, let me know below. And to use the manufacturer's maintenance schedule. Let's get this straight. Regular maintenance on your automobile is very important for keeping your car reliable and reducing repair costs. And it should be done exactly in accordance with the schedule that the manufacturer recommends. When you buy a car, most dealers will attempt to get you to subscribe to a maintenance schedule through their dealership and will tell you with dead seriousness that you need to follow that schedule to a T. Often, that's not true. Most dealer maintenance routines get you into their auto shop far more often than you need to be. Again, flip open that owner's manual, find the maintenance schedule information, and follow it yourself for all aspects of your car, from brake pad replacement to tire replacement. I do think car maintenance is something that often like floats out of the periphery of my knowledge and recognition. Um, there's a lot of things in life that I stay on top of and home maintenance is probably one step above automobile maintenance. But I think that car maintenance is important, especially if you want to get a good amount of life out of the automobile that you purchase. So I think I might check into what car maintenance we should be doing on our Honda. I take it for granted that when I climb in and I turn it on, everything's going to work as it should be. And you can't really do that if you don't invest in maintaining your vehicles. So I think that this is an area where I could use some growth and I... I think this might be the one little tidbit that I take from, from this section is to kind of think about what car maintenance should be done and think about doing that car maintenance. On the flip side of that, however, I mentioned previously that we bought our car in 2006, I think. It might have been 2007, but either way, it's 13 or 14 years old. So at this point, we might have to kind of weigh what makes more sense. Does it make more sense to do maintenance on a car that almost has 200,000 miles? Or does it make more sense to put that same amount of money away and set more money aside for purchasing um, a newer used vehicle? I do think at some point we will have to move on from our beloved Honda Fit, but um, I'm not quite sure if we're there yet. And I think that that's something that Jesse and I would have to talk about is, what maintenance should we be doing on our car that we probably haven't been doing on our car? And does it make sense to do that maintenance or should we be putting that money aside to buy a new vehicle? So if you are someone who's really, really good at keeping up with car maintenance, I'd love to hear your tips and tricks below. Today we are on number 37 in this book, which is to practice good gas conservation habits. It's often the little things that really add up, and with gas at more than $4 a gallon, it adds up to big money fast. Here are five more fuel conservation tips that individually won't save a significant amount, but over time, and done in combination, can save quite a bit of gas expense. Number one, tighten the gas cap as tightly as you can when you finish filling up. 
Gas evaporates rather quickly and a loose cap allows that evaporated gas to simply drift out of your tank. Number two, don't top off the tank. When you do, you dramatically increase the chance for gas to slosh out and when gas prices are high, even a bit of sloshing is money gone from your pocket. Number three, don't rest your left foot on the brake while driving. Even a slight accidental bump of the brake will cause some drag and some additional gas use, plus it'll increase the wear on your brake pads. Number four, turn off the air conditioning as you approach your destination. When you're 10 or 15 minutes away from where you need to be, turn off your air conditioning. This will improve your car's mileage and the cab of your car won't get warm enough during that period to cause any discomfort. And the fifth tip is to use appropriate tires for the weather. Snow tires in the summer significantly reduce your gas mileage. I think all of those are pretty good tips. I think the two that resonated the most with me is uh, tip number one, which is to tighten the gas cap as tightly as you can when you finish filling up. I didn't realize that gas evaporated that quickly and I don't know that I've ever really paid attention to whether or not my gas cap is fully tightened. So I think that's something that'll be more intentional about moving forward. And then the second one, um, I actually stopped topping off numerous years ago when I learned about gas spillage and uh, realized how bad that is for the environment as is driving but um, and so that's something that I wanted to just generally reduce was the amount of gas spillage so I haven't topped off for quite some time but the other one that kind of spoke to me was to turn off the air conditioning as you approach your destination we um, as I've mentioned have a rather old Honda Fit that we drive around and it hasn't had a functioning air condition for the last couple of summers so 40 minutes into a drive you actually might get air conditioning, but until that point, you don't usually. And so I actually haven't even used the air conditioning that much this summer because most of my drives are less than that period of time. So I do windows down and just embrace the fact that everywhere I go, I have slightly wind blown hair. <laughs> um, but I think that those are some good tips. I don't know if there's anything else um, that you can think of that are kind of small ways to reduce your um, the, the cost of driving. And I would love to hear those below if you have them, so you can put them in the comments down below. On tip number 38 in the book, which is to use public transportation. If you live in an area where you have easy access to public transportation, use it. Use it to commute to work, to attend social and cultural events, and to run errands. The cost savings of using public transportation is tremendous if you get into the habit of using it consistently. If you can use the bus or the rails to take a trip for $2 when you would otherwise have to drive your car, burn two gallons of gas, pay for parking, and add extra miles onto the car that push you closer to maintenance, the choice is pretty easy. We live in a fairly rural area of the state that we're in, and unfortunately our public transportation system is really sad. Uh, there is a bus, and I've taken it to run into sort of the neighboring area where there's a little bit more shopping and shops. And it, I think it was $2.25, and it took maybe 50 minutes to get there. Um, and it didn't run very frequently. I think it ran about once an hour. So I did catch it maybe an, a mile, mile and a half from the house and I rode it into Silverdale, a trip that would normally take me 15 minutes in the car, and I was able to get off at a stop that wasn't too far from where I was going, and then I was able to walk to where I was going, get the things that I needed, and then um, jump back on the bus and come home. And so there is a public transportation op option here in the county we live in, but it, it definitely isn't very robust and it isn't very convenient. So if you do live in an area where you can use public transportation, absolutely do it. I know when we are going to the airport, we actually take several forms of public transportation to get there. So every time we travel, we're kind of on like this plane, train, and automobile kind of adventure. So we're walking distance to the ferry, which I consider anything two miles or less to be walking distance. So we're walking distance to the ferry. We catch a ferry over into Seattle. Once we're in Seattle, we take the light rail um, to the airport. And the whole trip, to the airport. Um, you don't pay for the ferry going from where we live to Seattle. And then I think it's maybe three or four bucks to ride the light rail to the airport. And then on the way back, you pay for the light rail and then you pay for the ferry. So the whole thing ends up coming to maybe $20 per person. But 
We don't have to drive the car, which it's an hour and a half from here. We don't have to find parking. We don't have to pay to park the car while we're gone. So it's a really great option when we're traveling to take public transportation. And typically when we go into a metropolitan area to travel and vacation, we will often use public transportation once we get there. So I will look up ahead of time to see what public transportation options are available where we're going and if there's certain apps that are required, I'll familiarize myself with them and know kind of how to pay for the public transportation when we get on it. And I find that that's part of the adventure of traveling is to look into public transportation, research it, learn something new, and then try something a little bit novel and different. So if you use public transportation where you live, if you're happy with it, if you're not happy with it, um, we would love to hear about it below. Just go ahead and leave a comment, which is minimize your load. When you're driving on the highway, most of your engine power goes toward overcoming air drag, the resistance that the air is putting on your car. When you have extra items on your car, such as stuff bundled to the roof or even a ski rack, you're reducing your gas mileage by as much as 5%. Similarly, excess weight in your car reduces your gas mileage, so if you're using your trunk as a storage unit, you'll save yourself a significant amount by getting that stuff out of the car. I don't know if any of you have those little camping domes where you can put all your goodies in on top of your car, or if you have ski or kayak racks, but I would be interested to know if those reduce your gas mileage or if you've noticed that they reduce your gas mileage. We don't have anything on the exterior of our car, but I do know that sometimes I'll leave stuff in the car um, that probably does somehow increase our gas mileage. For the most part, I do like a cleaned out car, and so we don't usually have a lot of things rattling around back there, but it is a good thing to think of when it comes to are you keeping spare tires back there that you don't necessarily need? I know on our truck, sometimes in the winter, we'll put sandbags or extra weight in the back to give us a little bit more stability, but that probably definitely decreases our gas mileage as well. So some good things to consider there when it comes to how heavy your car is and whether or not you have some external things on your car as well. Um, you may have just heard my dog Rudy sneeze. I know you guys haven't seen our animals, but um, he's right here. So I'll just take a moment and introduce you to Rudy. Ooh, he's not a huge fan of being picked up, but this is Rudy. Rudy is a long-haired Chihuahua Papillon mix, um, or at least that's what we think he is. He was adopted from the animal shelter in our area, and he's been part of our family for about four years. And when I film these videos in our home, you might hear the noises of our animals because it's pretty rare that they're all snoozing at the same time. So the littlest one is Rudy, which you get to meet today. And then maybe over the coming weeks, we'll have an opportunity to meet some of the other animals as well. Number 39, which is to carpool. If you have an opportunity to share a ride to and from work with someone, jump on it. The cost savings of carpooling is tremendous. If your commute causes you to burn two gallons of gas and put 40 miles on your car, just two days a week of riding with someone else can put the savings per month well over $100. Carpooling can also add some time savings to the picture as well if you have access to the HOV lane. If you work in a large organization, it's pretty easy to get a carpool started. Send out an email to as many coworkers as you can stating that you're interested in starting a pool from your area and see how many responses you get. I remember for a while, my sister and I were working at the same job and several days a week, we were able to carpool. Occasionally we had offsite meetings or other things that didn't allow us to share a ride to and from work, but we were able to carpool a few times a week and it felt really good. It felt good from a cost savings perspective, but also from an environmental perspective, knowing that there was one fewer car on the road, consuming gas, you know, putting pollution into the waterways, it just really felt like a really positive way to give back that was also pretty simple. It also took some of the pressure off of having to drive every day, so we were able to take turns and one person could get caught up on a few other things or we could talk about what we were hearing on the radio or what we were doing at work during the day, so it was a really enjoyable experience. 
I know here we have worker driver buses for the shipyard near where we live. And a lot of people choose that option because they don't have to drive in, combat traffic, find and pay for parking. And so there's worker driver buses that go all across the county where we live and pick people up to take them to the shipyard. And I always feel really happy seeing people use that option because it's saving them money, but it's also helping the environment. If you're able to carpool, I would love to hear about it in the comments below. And if you have any <laughs> carpool nightmare stories, of course, share those as well. On number 40 of this book, which is called Use a Bicycle. Most nearby trips, such as a trip to the post office or a trip to the local grocery store are very short, just a mile or two each way. They're also full of stop and go driving, which is the least efficient kind of driving for an automobile. Instead of driving, get a used bicycle and use it for these short little trips. Install a small basket on the front so you can easily carry a couple bags of groceries or a package to be mailed. It's a free mode of transportation, doesn't take much longer than a car over a short trip, and is a good way to get a bit of exercise too. We live in an area that has a ton of hills, <laughs> and so I have never fully embraced bicycle life simply because I find it so challenging to ride a bicycle up a hill and you can't go anywhere here without encountering some really pretty steep hills. But I did at the start of my sabbatical that I began taking last fall, I did make a promise to myself that if there was a trip that I needed to make that was two miles or less, I would try and make it on foot whenever possible. And so last fall and over the winter, I did a lot of walking. Um, there are three grocery stores within two miles of where we live. There's a post office within two miles of where we live. The library is only about a mile, mile and a half away. And so I was able to kind of lump some of my trips. I packed a backpack with just a simple water bottle and some reusable totes. And then I was able to load up at the grocery store and walk back or grab the books that I needed from the library or mail something I had sold on Mercari or Poshmark at the post office. And so I really liked it. I liked how intentional I was about my trips. I liked planning for the trip. I liked picking out what I was going to listen to when I took the trip. I would often save some of my favorite podcasts or audiobooks for while I was walking to and from my errands. And again, it really connected me with the sense that I was intentionally doing something that was better for me and better for the planet and the environment. I, at the time, didn't even really think about the cost savings. I mostly thought that I didn't want to increase my carbon emissions in that way, and I really wanted to be able to walk and move and do things at a slower pace since I was more time rich rather than being more maybe money rich. So I would love to hear from you if you found ways that you can move yourself around to do your errands as needed, whether it be by bicycle or on foot, or if you have some other way of manually powering yourself around. Um, I would love to hear about that in the comments below. Number 41 is to eliminate one of your cars entirely. If you find yourself using your bicycle in public transportation frequently, you'll likely find that one of your automobiles is being used less and less. Consider selling it. Not only will you make some money from the sale, but you'll have a smaller car insurance payment and no licensing costs to worry about either. Plus, you may free up some garage space that can be put to better use in other ways. This is a big step, but it's one that can save you a ton of money on a monthly basis. This last fall on my Instagram channel, at Little Tidbits of Joy, I did a summary of the costs of car ownership. We don't have a car payment, but I knew that there were some really obvious and some kind of sneaky costs associated with car ownership. And so I did a little bit of a breakdown of what it costs for our Honda Fit. I had recently done a little bit of car upkeep and maintenance, which was long overdue. And so I priced out some of those items along with things like insurance, our registration for the tabs, um, other things like light bulb repair and tires and things of that nature. And it actually turns out that it cost us about $225 a month to own and run a car. That does include my gas expenses as well. 
And that's a decent chunk of change. So if there's a way you can use public transportation, carpooling, ride sharing, other options, you'll save yourself a decent chunk of money each month in car ownership. I would love to know if you have transitioned to being a one or none car household and what other means of transportation you use. And also if you've priced out what it actually costs you to own your car, I would love to know that as well. And if you want to check out the story that I made, I saved it as a highlight on my Instagram page. Again, it's at little tidbits of joy and it's under car maintenance, I think. And you can just kind of click through the story that I created that highlights the different features that I was looking at when it comes to creating that average monthly cost. We are on number 42 in this book, which is don't speed, instead use cruise control. It's tempting to speed when you're driving somewhere, particularly when the commute is long. But speeding is an incredibly expensive trade-off. It reduces your fuel efficiency, making the trip itself cost more. It puts more wear and tear on your automobile, increasing the chances of a necessary repair. It also increases the chance of an accident, as speeding gives you less time to react. If that's not enough, you also run the danger of being issued a speeding ticket which has not only a direct cost, but can raise your insurance rates as well. The cost of speeding, both potential and real, just to save a few minutes on a trip aren't worth it. Instead, just set the cruise control to the speed limit for long driving stretches. This will keep you from being tempted to speed. Well, I guess it's confession time. I am a chronic speeder. Um, I typically go about five miles per hour over the speed limit. Usually that's on the highway. If I'm on more rural or residential streets, I don't tend to speed, but on the highway, if it's 60 miles per hour here in the States, I usually try and go about 65. I don't try, it's just kind of unconscious. But I know that this tip has a lot of really good points in it. And I do think that I would like to apply them to my driving because I think that I would be a safer driver and I think that it will reduce all of the costs that they say. So I am going to make a commitment to speed less um, and use my cruise control more. Usually on longer trips, I'm pretty good about setting my cruise control, but I'll often set my cruise control for five miles per hour over the speed limit. So I would love to hear if you are a speeder as well, or if you are a very safe driver who follows the speed limit. And if you've noticed that there are differences in costs related to speeding versus not speeding, I would love to hear about those below as well. Number 43 in the book, which is don't get optional stuff during maintenance. Often when you take your car in for maintenance, the workers inside will attempt to sell you additional products and services, such as replacement windshield wiper blades or a new air filter. Never buy them there. The cost they charge you for a new blade or a new filter, plus the cost for the minute's worth of work to install them, is far beyond reasonable. Instead, go to a discount auto parts store and buy these items yourself. Then use the car's manual to install them. You'll not only save a lot on the part itself, but you'll save on the labor cost. I'm guilty of this tip as well. <laughs> um, I took the car in for an oil change probably last fall. And while I was there, they said something about replacing my windshield wipers. And we were just getting into rainy season and I noticed that they were kind of smearing the windshield. And I thought, you know, I know it's cheaper to get these somewhere else and install them myself. But I also know that just getting them replaced there would completely take that item off of my to-do list. And I had a little bit of regret after, but I went ahead and I had them replace them and I know that we ended up spending more money than we needed to. So I definitely think this is a great tip when you take your car in for some sort of maintenance that you're choosing not to do yourself. Instead of having them upgrade you to do wipers and filters and lights, just go ahead and fix those things on your own if you're able. So that is our tip for today. Um, I do apologize if there was a lot of bird noise. I noticed that there's a murder of crows in like a tree not too far away and they seem to be having some sort of staff meeting. <laughs> and today everyone is just like above and beyond in the vocal department. So um, if you heard a lot of bird noises, please know that I also hear those bird noises and they're a little bit louder than they normally are. And number 44 is to shop around for car repairs. 
When your car needs repairs, don't simply take it back to the dealership. Pull out the yellow pages or check out Google Maps and call several nearby auto repair facilities. Look for those that are ASE, Automotive Service Excellence Certified. You should also consult any of your friends who have knowledge about cars and ask if they have any recommended repair shops. If your car is under warranty, make sure the repair shop will honor that warranty. This will go a long way toward getting you a quality auto repair for a much cheaper price. I know when it comes to bigger repairs for our cars, if we can't do them ourselves, which Jesse's pretty dang handy, so he's able to do quite a few things. We do tend to try and shop around for different repair shops and get the best price and the best deal. I know there was one time that we couldn't do this for my truck. Um, the transmission went out while I was, I think that's what it was, the transmission. I'm not super great with my car knowledge, but um, it went out while I was driving the truck. And so all we could do is basically like limp it to the nearest repair shop. And that is the repair shop that we ended up using because otherwise we would have had to tow it somewhere and that just didn't seem to be the best financial choice. So um, I think if you have the luxury of having a repair that can be scheduled and can be made in advance, definitely do your research. Um, if you're in the middle of nowhere and your car breaks down and there's only one shop that can fix it, then you're obviously going to have to go with that option. But when possible, do your research and I do think it will save you some money. Today's tip number 45 is to pay for car repairs with a credit card. Now this one I think can be maybe a little bit controversial for some people who don't believe in having credit cards or using credit cards, but let's see what they have to say and then we can talk about it. When you get your car repaired, pay for the repair with a credit card and then pay the credit card balance off immediately. Why? Credit cards offer significant consumer protection against fraud. If your car repair is faulty, you can contact your credit card company and have them deal with it rather than trying to fight it yourself, and likely coughing up more dough for more repairs. It's kind of an interesting take. I didn't know that that's the direction that they were going to go with this. I thought that it might be because you can often get a credit card that gives you rewards or cash back. So when you're using a credit card for a bigger purchase like this, you actually could get some money back or you could get air miles or something of that nature. But it is interesting to think that if you maybe went to a mechanic and for some reason they did a really faulty repair that you could actually contest the charge. So I'd be interested to know if anyone's tried this or if you know that this is successful. I think before I felt comfortable doing this, I would want to do some research and make sure that that's actually true and that's actually a thing that you can do with a credit card is to use them for faulty repairs and things of that, that nature. So um, I definitely think if you are someone who maybe is just kind of getting your financial legs under you and credit cards are a way that you spend money maybe without thinking about it and without being intentional about making the purchases. Maybe if you're struggling with credit card debt, it might not be the best idea to use a credit card for this type of purchase. But I also think that if you're someone who has maybe been doing this a while or you've never struggled with credit card debt, Credit cards are a great way to get cash back and earn rewards for things like these bigger purchases. Jesse and I use credit cards for all sorts of things. Any bill that can be paid with a credit card, we put on a credit card and then we don't carry a balance on our credit cards. But I would say last year I probably earned, you know, somewhere between five and eight hundred dollars in cash back. Um, a big portion of that was actually a large purchase that I made for a job I was working at and then I was reimbursed and it was a huge purchase and so because I have a pretty high limit on my credit card I was able to get several hundred dollars back from making this purchase um, for the place that I worked at. So I think, I think that this tip the way that I originally thought they were going to do it um, was to use a credit card to get cash back and so forth but the way that they're talking about it is to fight bad repairs and I would like to do a little more exploration about that or hear your thoughts on that in the comments below. Today we have plan ahead for a car replacement. If you want to replace your car as cheaply as possible, the best time to start thinking about it is the day you purchased the previous model. Start putting a small amount away each month automatically and forget about that amount until your next car purchase. 
Putting $50 away each month into a 3% APY savings account gives you $4,000 towards your next car purchase after six years. That plus a trade-in is enough to let you drive off the lot with a very tiny loan. Putting away $100 a month will give you $8,000 after six years, likely more than enough to allow you to trade in your current car then drive off the lot with a late model used car without taking out a loan, no car payments at all. I think I mentioned this in our appliances section when I was talking about kind of setting money aside and I know that this is something that Jesse and I need to do, although I definitely think that we'll buy something that's fairly inexpensive and used. So I don't know how much we need to set aside, but as our Honda gets older and the mileage gets higher, definitely thinking about what our plan is for our next vehicle is important. So if you already have a little fund where you've tucked away some money for your next car, we would love to hear about it in the comments below. And I certainly appreciate you joining me through all of these little tips and tricks on ways to be frugal and thrifty with our automobiles. Our next section, I'm actually probably going to go out of order. The next section is cheap tactics for banking and investing. And that sounds very, very boring to me. So I am going to find a section in here that sounds a little bit more exciting and we'll jump into that next and I'll save up banking and investing for a later date. But I will see you back here tomorrow for another daily dose of frugality. Thanks for tuning in.